Since the great financial crisis, there has been much soul searching in a number of advanced economies about their monetary policy frameworks, which have been strained by the need to nurse economies back to health and stubbornly low inflation. Emerging market economies have had less reason to review their frameworks because these economies have fared much better during the great financial crisis. That said, since then, they have had to tackle the challenge of the spillovers of very accommodative conditions in advanced economies. The evolution of emerging market monetary policy frameworks dates back to the late 1990s. This was largely in response to the Asian financial crisis. Since then, we have seen a widespread adoption of inflation targeting, alongside a greater degree of exchange rate flexibility. But importantly, except for a few cases, not quite free-floating, which is more common in advanced economies. Moreover, these monetary policy frameworks have been complemented by the active use of macroprudential measures. This is yet another case of practice moving ahead of theory, just as with the adoption of inflation targeting by some advanced economies in the early 1990s. Standard textbooks, in fact, prescribed freely floating regimes. In this year's annual economic report, we examine the practice of inflation targeting in emerging market economies. The overarching question we address is why so many emerging market inflation targeters combine it with FX intervention, and indeed increasingly with macroprudential measures. Let me highlight three takeaways. First, a key factor underlying the choice of monetary policy frameworks is that emerging market economies are more sensitive to capital flows and exchange rate fluctuations than advanced economies. Second, this worsens two potential monetary policy trade-offs. It can make it harder to stabilize output and inflation at the same time, and it can make it harder to reconcile macroeconomic financial and price stability today with macroeconomic financial and price stability tomorrow, yet another intertemporal trade-off. And finally, FX intervention combined with macroprudential measures can help address these two trade-offs as it adds a valuable degree of freedom. In fact, FX intervention has many macroprudential-like features. So let me provide some context and then address each of these points in turn. This graph traces the evolution of macroprudential frameworks in uh, monetary policy frameworks in emerging market economies. Since 2000, the percentage of inflation targeters has increased substantially in EMEs. Left-hand panel, yellow bars. Still, FX reserves have surged, center panel, red bars, much more than in advanced economy, that's the blue bars, in part reflecting emerging market economies leaning against the exchange rate more than advanced economies. Moreover, we see that emerging market economies have used macroprudential measures more actively than advanced economies. In the right-hand panel, the red line is well above the blue line. As seen in this graph, these frameworks have served emerging market economies well. Inflation, while higher, has tended to converge to that in advanced economies. In the left-hand panel, the red line has been falling and getting closer to the blue line. And growth has been quite good. In the center panel, the red line is uniformly above the blue line. That said, rapid credit growth may represent a risk going forward. In the right-hand side panel, the red line is considerably above the blue line for much of the post-crisis period, and I will come back to this. A perennial challenge that emerging market economies face is that they are highly sensitive to capital flows and exchange rate fluctuations. This graph shows the large waves of capital flows which are the red bars, the large swings in exchange rates, the red line, and their close correlation. These have a large impact on domestic financial markets and on the economy more generally. This higher sensitivity reflects in part structural features in emerging market economies. One set of features relate to aspects that are real in nature. The larger weight of food in the consumption basket and the stronger second round effects in wages tend to make inflation more sensitive to the exchange rate. We see in this graph that while pass-through in emerging market economies has declined, that's the red line, 
it is still generally above that in advanced economies, that's the blue line. To be sure, there are substantial regional differences. Pass-through in Asia is generally lower than in Latin America. But overall, inflation expectations are less well anchored in the face of exchange rate fluctuations in emerging market economies than in advanced economies. The other set of factors are financial in nature. The domestic institutional investor base is typically not as developed. As the left-hand panel of this graph shows, the size of such investors as a percentage of GDP is smaller than in a representative sample of advanced economies. The red bars are lower than the blue bars. Partly as a result, market depth, that is the ability to absorb purchases and sales without large price moves, tends to be lower. And above all, instruments to hedge FX risk are less readily available. The right-hand panel illustrates this. We see that FX derivatives turnover, scaled here by GDP, is lower in emerging market economies. The red bars are lower than the blue bars. Moreover, these two factors are closely related. An institutional investor base that also invests in foreign currency could act as a natural counterpart to the hedging needs of domestic firms. Chile's experience highlights the relevance of this factor. These features become especially relevant when considered in relation to the size of the capital flows that can buffet emerging market economies. This suggests that the importance of currency mismatches is greater in emerging market economies than in advanced economies. Not because the share of FX liabilities is higher there, it is not, but because the ability to hedge is lower and the cost higher. The key point then is that currency mismatches amplify the impact of exchange rate fluctuations driven by external conditions. And this is regardless, regardless of whether the currency mismatches are in borrowers' or lenders' balance sheets. If borrowers are more, have more liabilities than assets in foreign currency, a say appreciation of the local currency improves their financial condition, encouraging further borrowing and lending in both foreign and domestic currency. If lenders, in particular institutional investors or foreign investors generally, hold local currency assets on an unhedged basis, an appreciation would benefit them twice. Empirical evidence confirms this. Since appreciations go hand in hand with declining yields, foreign investors would benefit from both currency and capital gains at the same time when returns are measured in their home currency. These mechanisms obviously operate in reverse when the domestic currency depreciates. This is what is called the financial channel of the exchange rate. Over the past decade or so, the relevance of this channel has increased as a result of two developments portrayed in this graph. Foreign currency debt in emerging market economies has increased substantially, that's the left-hand panel, and so has the participation of foreign investors in domestic markets. That's the right-hand panel. A key feature of the financial channel of the exchange rate is that it generates a self-reinforcing process. An appreciation loosens domestic financial conditions, induces further capital inflows, and hence loosens conditions further. Correspondingly, a depreciation tightens financial conditions and induces further capital outflows. As discussed next, this financial channel induced higher sensitivity of emerging market economies to exchange rate fluctuations worsens policy trade-offs, and it tends to reduce tolerance for fleeting, free, freely floating exchange rates. Emerging markets economy higher sensitivity to capital flows and to the exchange rate through the financial channel of the exchange rate worsens two types of potential policy trade-off. The first type of trade-off is that it becomes harder to stabilize output and inflation at the same time. The reason is that the financial channel of the exchange rate influences output and inflation in opposite directions. All else equal as, say, exchange rate depreciation raises inflation but reduces output by tightening domestic financial conditions and dampening domestic demand. Moreover, it can also make it harder to finance exports, an effect which is amplified by global value chains. This is quite different from the standard trade channel of the exchange rate, which influences output and inflation in the same direction, so that a, say, depreciation boosts exports by making the economy more competitive. <laughs> 
There is indeed empirical evidence suggesting that all else equal, financial conditions in emerging market economies become looser as the exchange rate appreciates. The left-hand panel in this graph shows that in response to an appreciation, the spread between local currency bond yield and the corresponding US Treasury yield, that's the red line, as well as the credit risk premium, that's the blue line, decline in tandem, and that domestic credit increases, that's in the right-hand panel. Inflation and output moving in opposite directions can create dilemmas for the central bank. Think, for instance, of the havoc caused by currency mismatches following sharp depreciations at times of financial crisis. Should the central bank reduce interest rates to support output, or should it raise them to control inflation? An advanced economy central bank would not face the same dilemma. A depreciation would be unambiguously expansionary. This trade-off is exacerbated by two additional structural features in emerging market economies. For one, foreign currency invoicing, in fact largely US dollar invoicing, is more prevalent than in advanced economies. This means that, at least in the near term, exports respond less to a currency depreciation. More importantly, as exchange rate pass-through tends to be higher in emerging market economies, inflation responds more strongly. The second type of trade-off is that under some circumstances, it becomes harder to reconcile macroeconomic financial and price stability today with macroeconomic financial and price stability tomorrow, an intertemporal trade-off. This occurs through two mechanisms. One is surges and reversals in capital flows and the associated exchange rate fluctuations. Capital flow surges can generate financial vulnerabilities owing to excessive risk-taking. That is, they raise the probability and costs of subsequent reversals. The other mechanism is through the impact of the surges and reversals on domestic financial booms and busts through credit and asset prices, and in particular, property prices. We're all familiar with the serious damage that such domestic financial cycles can cause to the economy. There is indeed considerable evidence that these mechanisms are at work and reinforce each other. This graph shows the evolution of cross-border debt flows, the real exchange rate, a standard measure of the domestic financial cycle around times of financial distress, that is banking crisis, denoted by the vertical lines, in both advanced and emerging market economies, the left and right-hand panel, respectively. We can see that the expansion and contraction phases of the domestic financial cycle, that's the blue line, tend to coincide with upswings and downswings in both cross-border debt flows, that's the red line, and the exchange rate, that's the yellow line. But the pattern is more pronounced for emerging market economies, at least with respect to the exchange rate. This is consistent with more formal empirical evidence, indicating that the combination of strong credit growth and exchange rate appreciation is a useful leading indicator of financial crisis for emerging market economies, but not for advanced economies. Thus, overall, capital flows and the exchange rate amplify the domestic financial cycle, especially in emerging market economies. It is easy to see how this can give rise to dilemmas for monetary policy. Imagine that inflation is below target and owing to strong capital inflows, the currency comes under appreciation pressure. The central bank could then reduce interest rates to push inflation up. But that would tend to add further fuel to any domestic financial cycle expansion. Over time, this could risk generating a bust and inducing a capital flow reversal and an exchange rate depreciation. Or at a minimum, it would make the economy more vulnerable to a reversal of capital flows. Either way, the longer term result would be the same, a contraction in economic activity and a burst in inflation linked to the sharp currency depreciation. Thus, under such conditions, better economic performance today would be secured at the expense of worse economic performance tomorrow. These considerations point to a key policy implication. Wisely implemented, foreign exchange intervention can alleviate the two trade-offs I mentioned. Effectively, it adds a useful degree of freedom. FX intervention improves the trade-offs primarily by dampening the impact of the financial channel of the exchange rate. That is, in the short run, its opposite impact on inflation and output, 
and in the longer run, its impact on financial and macroeconomic vulnerabilities. Indeed, in the second case, FX intervention has strong macroprudential-like features. To the extent that it leans against capital flows and their impact on the domestic financial cycle, it helps restrain the buildup in both. At the same time, by accumulating FX reserve buffers, it improves the resilience of the economy against reversals in both, for which function, by the way, it does not even need to influence the exchange rate. <coughs> there is indeed evidence that FX intervention can restrain the impact of capital flows on the exchange rate and on domestic credit expansion. This is shown in this graph. In the left-hand panel, we see that FX purchases and capital inflows, roughly of the same size, have roughly equal offsetting impacts on the exchange rate. The red and blue bars have roughly the same size. And in the right-hand panel, the FX purchases also dampen credit growth, again offsetting the impact of the capital inflows on it. Here, the two bars, again, are roughly of the same size. That said, FX intervention is no panacea. For one, as the evidence indicates, its effect on the exchange rate is temporary, so that it would need to be used repeatedly when seeking to dampen exchange rate fluctuations. In addition, and closely related, FX intervention often involves large costs, because the return on the FX assets is typically lower than the cost of the liabilities that fund them. And finally, uh, in an extreme scenario, were it to be perceived as a form of insurance and to reduce the sense of two-way risk, FX intervention could encourage further inflows and, in the longer run, those very currency mismatches that are at the origin of vulnerabilities. This suggests that a balanced policy approach would embed wisely executed FX intervention in a broader macrofinancial stability framework. An essential element of such a framework is macroprudential measures. These measures, largely targeted to address the potential intertemporal trade-offs, can strengthen the resilience of the financial system, can help to restrain domestic financial booms and busts, and can address currency mismatches directly. We analyze their strengths and limitations in some detail in a special chapter in the annual, report, annual economic report last year. In some cases, such macroprudential frameworks have also been complemented with capital flow management measures a tool that, given its limitations, is best used sparingly. There are clearly a number of difficult questions that need to be answered to work out a full analytical basis for such a holistic framework, and of course, to implement it. The range of questions involves strategy, tactics, and institutional arrangements, including, including the role of interest rate policy. But again, emerging market economists' practice has moved ahead of theory, and the direction of travel is clear. Thank you. <laughs>